guys, I want to welcome you to the weekly Wednesday for the Financial Freedom Newsletter, where every week, every Wednesday, we delve into something inspirational, motivational, something excerpt taken from the Financial Freedom Weekly Newsletter. Wherever you are, if you're listening on Spotify, on iTunes, Google, be sure to click the like, subscribe, share, comment. Without ado, let's get into the show. Welcome, everybody, to this week's podcast episode for the Financial Freedom Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Christopher Liu. And as you know, I talk about the four different types of freedom, time, financial, location, health freedom. And in that light, I'm always interviewing entrepreneurs, consultants, people influencing, changing the world for the better. So today... I have a guest, uh, Hensley Elfritz, and she's actually a fitness and wellness brand scaler. And today's conversation is going to be all about branding, marketing, positioning, and how she applies it to her particular niche in the fitness and consulting industry. So uh, Hensley, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here. Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, yeah, Happy New Year in uh, 2023. Hopefully we'll be just as good, if not better than 2022. And um, so tell us more about yourself, your business and how you got started. It's uh, I think it's helpful to give a little bit of background because it sheds light on to uh, where we are today. So my background has been in fitness franchising, specifically in installing sales systems in kind of either fitness and health brands that were up and running or turning them around. So in short, making those brands profitable. So I started at Equinox, just selling memberships. And then most recently um, was the VP of sales for a brand called Club Pilates. As of today, I think they're they're closing in at about 2000 locations, again, across the US and globally. And so During the pandemic, I think a lot of us had epiphanies, but mine was looking out at our industry, the boutique fitness industry, and seeing one out of three studios close and really feeling compelled personally to take what I knew worked across what I had seen, you know, work across 10 um, different fitness entities and bring that to independent studio owners. So uh, we started in November, 2020. I had no intent of starting a company. I literally just wanted to help independent business owners. Um, And then fast forward two years later, we've worked with about a hundred, gosh, I think it's probably closer to 150 unique brands. We moved, um, from boutique fitness into also chiropractic, physical therapy, and then the recovery space as well. Um, And our kind of claim to fame is that we work with our clients over the span of 12 weeks, uh, installing these recurring revenue systems, and 90% of our clients recoup their investment by the time they're finished working with us. Um, And 95% are doing better a year later than they were today. So it's exciting stuff. It does work. Um, and you know, it's a cool industry because so many of us are really passionate about what they, what we do, but we don't know how to make money doing it long-term. So it's cool to bring that strategy to, uh, independent business owners. Yeah. It's a very, uh, it's a very awesome story. And I liked how you started, um, you know, a lot of businesses started in the pandemic and you found their particular niche and, um, a need and you try to fill it with your expertise. So yes. uh, you, you've actually got a really interesting um, repertoire of questions. And one is uh, with this idea of what helped you build your reputation within your market. Yeah. I think for so many of us, the the knee jerk reaction when we're growing our bi- business, when we're getting up and off of the ground is how can I reach the most people with what I do? And when we look at the brands that we know best, the ones that come to mind that probably are within arm's reach of us today, right? Apple, um, Amazon, Lululemon. Amazon started as an online book reseller. Lululemon started as selling yoga pants to female yogis, right? And then again, fast forward to where those brands are today, the riches are in the niches, at least initially. That's where you gain reputation. If you can find those loyalists and um, those p- champions that are able to shout, hey, this person is really good at doing what she does, 
that was how we were able to grow into, again, the chiropractic space and the physical therapist space was all through client referrals. So focus on what you do and doing it really, really well, gaining momentum there first, and then applying those same strategies um, against parallel verticals that you feel like would be just as applicable. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Which, which is really interesting, especially with the Amazon story was they, they started out with the online books and then they just basically became built to horizontals and vertical. And then um, what's interesting is in terms of your upbringing, how does it apply to, you know, a lot of companies are right now they can lose clients. You know, people have a lot of different options and choices. What, what are most businesses doing wrong with client retention? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think where I see the most prevalent mistake being made is waiting until that client is getting ready to either cancel or leave or has essentially already decided to quit to try and implement a retention strategy. And I always say that's like trying to save a ship that's already sinking. That decision has already been made. So instead, a successful retention strategy comes with how you onboard the client and making sure they understand that this is built on a relationship between you and them. It's dynamic. It's a lifestyle change, right? It's not a quick fix. And then maintaining that retention strategy throughout their either membership or client or patient lifetime so that you're essentially preventing them from ever getting to the point where they'd want to cancel. But worst case, they come to you, they want to cancel. You have this we say ammunition, right? You have these words and conversations and relations with them that you can use to try and salvage this client versus having to depend on, well, wait, if you stay with us, we'll give you 50% off, right? Or we'll throw in this freebie. You won't have to get to that point if you're continuing to put straws on the value camel's back and again, prevent them from from making that decision at, at any point. Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, the other question um, I had was, um, especially with sales, and um, you have a you have this concept. One is uh, some people say marketing, the others say sales. But uh, wh- why do you say sales is the most crucial part of your business, and how do you build a bulletproof sales process for you and what you've done for your clients? Yeah, I think sales, especially in the health and wellness industry, has become this dirty word, especially when we're working with medical professionals, right? They feel like we need to give, be giving our patients a genuine recommendation and you should, right? Versus trying to sell them on something. And so the first thing we do when we work with all of our clients is erase the word sales from your vocabulary and instead look at this as prescriptive recommendations, right? Whether you are a fitness professional or you're a doctor, you are giving the person in front of you a recommendation that you know is going to better their health, right? And they're looking to you for that recommendation and you're selling them short if you don't give them the best, most valuable recommendation. And of course, there's a price point that comes with that, right? But that's what they're coming to you with. And these aren't people that you're pulling from, you know, the yellow phone book and being like, Hey, are you interested? They're raising their hands and telling you, Hey, I I need what you're providing. Um, so I think with where marketing gets this, this better reputation is that you're just kind of sharing information and it can be a lot more fun and creative. And absolutely it is right. It's trying to instill this need that doesn't exist, but by the time they've given you their information and they're either in front of you in your office, or they've asked you, Hey, what are my options after I finish my X, Y, Z plan? They're asking for you to present that recommendation, excuse me. Um, And I think one of the caveats of focusing on marketing and trying to push all of these people in front of you is if you don't have that conversion strategy that of, all right, once that person does raise their hand and express interest, are we calling them? Are we texting them? What does that text sound like? What does it sound like when they're in front of us? And they say, I loved it, but it was too expensive. I need to talk to talk about it with my spouse. If you aren't converting, at, we give a benchmark again, depending on industry of 30 to 60%. Once they walk through the door, 
you don't need to graduate to marketing yet because you're not converting where you should be and you'll just be wasting marketing dollars. Um, so I think that's not even, I think the data has shown that that's where it behooves you as a business owner to focus on that conversion, right? Sales process, but conversion process before you focus on those marketing channels. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I always hear this debate between sales and marketing. Uh, and I think, uh, I think it was Peter Drucker. He said, you know, sales, sales, marketing, and innovation. Those are the three key. Yes. Um, and it's like, it's like how you implement it when you use it. Um, so many different strategies. Yeah. Which, which is really interesting. And then now, um, you know, it's particularly in your uh, business, you know, especially as an entrepreneur, you have to, you're going into a niche and, and as a, you're, you're plowing through, you're making headways. So one thing is, um, one thing is, uh, what sort of obstacles or challenges did you face, you know, starting a business for those, I know it's 2023 and a lot of people are interested in starting. So what would you say to them in terms of challenges and getting through those? Yeah. And I think the, the challenges that I, I witnessed firsthand are what we see in the clients that we work with that are business owners as well. And I would say the biggest challenge for me was trying to understand preemptively what role I wanted to play in the business. Uh, like I said, I didn't ever see this. I didn't ever see myself having employees. I didn't even, didn't, I never saw this becoming a, a brand. I came out of the gates as, you know, Hensley Elifritz Fitness and Wellness Consulting. Um, and so having an idea of what hat you want to wear in the business and hats, plural, uh, allows you to determine what roles do you then need to fill. There's a idea that, okay, we need, you know, a salesperson or we need a marketing person or we need a um, operational person, but which of those are you, right? Identifying that first. And then who's going to be that complement that allows you to be the best business owner that you can be because it allows you to really lean into what you're passionate about in starting this business from the jump. Secondarily, I think there's a societal pressure to just grow for the sake of growing, to scale for the sake of scaling, to take on investors or to, you know, I always get asked, well, where do you want to be in five years? How many more employees do you want to get? What, what do you want your revenue to be? And it's, it, Focusing on those things dilutes the reason that I I got into this business for the in the first place, which is just interfacing with other business owners and sharing what I know works and will make them successful. And I never wanted to grow to the point where I was so behind the scenes that I wasn't interacting with them on a regular basis. And so the second thing I would ask yourself as kind of a budding entrepreneur or entrepreneur who's kind of hitting that next level of growth is what is your reason for growing and what is your reason for scaling and what's going to give you the healthiest lifestyle, right? Because for so many entrepreneurs, that's why we're getting into it is for that elusive work-life balance, but are you going to forfeit that for scaling? Because that's what everyone wants to see happen. Um, so really being realistic with yourself on what those, those growth goals are. Yeah. It's always interesting. Cause, uh, you know, some of my clients, they, I ask them why they want to start a business and they're like, they have more free time and, you know, they, <laughs> and it's like, they're actually getting into, you know, the, the business is going to be, that's, they're going to be their, you know, it's your like, life. Yeah. It is. It is. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where I. I often, you know, encourage other entrepreneurs is certainly when you're Figuring out your branding, determine that need that's not being met in your industry, right? Like what's your niche going to be? But just as importantly, is that going to be something that you're passionate about doing day in and day out? Because you will live and breathe it for seven days for, I mean, I've been doing this for two years and I'm still working seven days a week and I love it and I make my own schedule. But if this was a need that I witnessed, but I wasn't, I didn't feel personally passionate about delivering, I would have hit a wall at this point. So I think it's that balance too, right? You've established this niche or you see a need that's not being met or a product that is not being yet offered. Is that something that you feel personally willing to devote yourself to for the foreseeable future? Yeah. Um, we'll move on and also talk about, um, you know, as we're coming to the 
end of this, uh, we'll talk about, you know, you're creating a culture, you know, you're having employees and um, how has the culture of your organization impacted employee retention, client referrals, you know, business growth? Uh, tell us more about that. I think, um, you know, like I mentioned, my background was with a fitness brand called Club Pilates and Pure Bar and starting by going into these locations and trying to identify at the ground level what was working and what was not. And almost unanimous, unanimously, it started at the top, right? It started with an owner who wasn't involved or who was facing friction with their staff. And that bleeds into your clientele. Your clients know, you know, subconsciously and just intuitively if you are there as an owner or if this is, you know, a corporation that's not a small business. They know if your staff is unhappy or not. And so selfishly, in order to be profitable, I recognize our nucleus has to be strong. We have to be devoted to each other and in constant communication. And by that, I don't mean, you know, micromanagerial, but understanding where are we project wise? Where are we at motivation? What's bringing us down, right? And having those personal conversations with your staff on a regular basis. And again, that was part of why I wanted to stay small was because it does allow me to have um, these conversations throughout the day, every day. The other piece of that is looking at the qualities that you admire in your clients and that trying to trace that back into where do they see that in you? Because so often there is that almost mirroring, right? And then how can you, again, lean into that even more so in creating your marketing campaigns and choosing your brand colors in um, marketing for new clients? Because there are often certain qualities in your client avatar that are resembling in you and that are going to allow you to, again, not only get up and off the ground, but scale because they're more obvious to the public um, than you think they even are internally. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so really great conversation. Really interesting how you incorporate all these and, you know, uh, ventured into this area of entrepreneur. How do people um, contact you, follow you on social media, visit your website, etc.? Yeah, we're pretty easy. Um, our email is reboot, R-E-B-O-O-T-F-C dot com, as in Reboot Fitness Consulting. And then for social, just throw a B in there for boutique. Reboot BFC is our Instagram, our LinkedIn, and our Facebook handle. Also, I was fortunate enough that my parents gave me a pretty rare name. So if you type in Hensley Reboot on Google, I'm sure it's somewhere on the first page. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, so thanks for so much for an awesome conversation. Um, for all the listeners out there, um, Hensley's links will resources will be in the links in the show notes be sure to check her out on instagram linkedin and her website as well um she offers a um, complimentary 30-minute business assessment and with that thanks so much for coming on to the show and we wish everybody a happy new year thanks for having me chris you are listening if you like it be sure to like comment share subscribe we're on everywhere spotify itunes google amazon audible and without much ado be sure to thank this show's sponsors and we'll see you next week